to work with great, great athletes, amazing coaches, championship teams, and uh, they didn't get there because of me. I was able to learn from them just because they look at all aspects of performance when they're trying to be great. And uh, as was mentioned, you know, everyone works hard uh, in physical training. Uh, we've got good coaches that teach you, teach you the skills of your sport. But uh, sometimes one thing that gets uh, overlooked is just what do you do to get yourself mentally ready to play those last few hours leading up to a game time? And that's when it can be uh... Come on here. That's what can make or break an athlete, if you think about it. So before we get started in, in talking about performance routines, I'd like to... I'd like to uh, just ask you, you, you guys, you're athletes, what sports do you play? What sports are represented here? Football? What other sports? Shout it out. Yep. Basketball. Basketball player. Okay. Cross country. Cross country. Yes. It's not bike. Mountain bike. Great. Other? Softball. Softball. Baseball. Baseball. Okay. So we, we've got a whole, we run the gamut here, right? We've got athletes from all sports, and I'm guessing that many of you are probably a multi-sport athletes. You play other, more than just one sport. So um, obviously you're going to have to take what we talked about tonight and apply it to your sport. But I think uh, I think that would be easy to do. So let, let's talk first about about I like to think of performance as a puzzle. There's a lot of important pieces of the puzzle, and the, and the more pieces of the puzzle you have in place, the better you're going to perform. So for you as athletes right now, just at the stage where you're at, what have been some of the important parts of you becoming a good athlete up to this point in your careers? What are some of the things that are have been important to you to grow at what you do? Really a reading from a great athlete. Physically fit. What was that? Physically fit. Physically fit, right? We got like uh, Brennan said, we have this this training facility here. Most schools have very nice uh, weight rooms and and there's a lot of emphasis on strength and conditioning, getting faster, getting stronger. Okay? Being fit. Okay? So fitness is one. A couple others. What's the other? We have a few coaches here, right? Okay. What are, what are, you, what are you emphasizing as a coach? What was that? The skill. The skill. Skill development, right? you got to master the basic fundamentals of your sport to be good at what you do, right? So that's why you do lots and lots of repetition, doing things the right way so that you can replicate that when it's time to, to play the game. Okay? Other things? Oh, no. Attitude. Attitude. Okay? Good. We'll talk more about attitude in a little bit. Yeah, having a positive attitude, believing in yourself, uh, being excited about what you're doing. Okay? What about sleep? Eating. Those are all important as well, right? So taking care of your, your health needs. Um, Hydration, getting yourself recovered. Uh, I think that's a big thing that happens in athletic in the in the world of athletics right now is everyone wants to train harder and and spend more time. And sometimes one thing that gets overlooked is recovery, especially recovery going into performances. So there's a whole bunch of things. The strategy. Um, uh, uh, you have to be able to make good in-game adjustments. All of those things are important piece. But the mental piece, I think becomes really important, especially as it becomes time to go out and perform what it is you've been practicing all those hours for, what you've been spending all the time doing those running drills and weight training and all that. Now that last uh, few hours, that last day leading up to your performance, that's where the mental piece becomes really, really critical. And that's what we're going to spend our time talking about tonight is pre-game routines, getting yourself mentally ready to play. So. Um, assuming you've done everything you needed to, to do to prepare yourself for performance, your mental game then can either make or break what it is you're going to do. Let me give you an example of this. In uh, 1992, there was a swimmer uh, representing the United States of America 
named Jeff Rouse. Jeff Rouse was uh, uh, going into the Olympics. He was the favorite um, in the 100 meter backstroke. So just a, just a, a great athlete uh, that trained well. He was ready, for, ready to go for the Olympics. Um, but he talked about as he got ready to go to the Olympics, the last months leading up to it, everyone kind of expected that, that, that if he swam well, he would win. Um, so he started to listen to a lot of the hype that, you know, the only way you're going to be remembered in this sport is if you break the world record and win the gold medal. And so he really started to, to overly focus on that. I'm going to go there. But I have to go there, I have to win, I have to set a world record. Um, that's what people are expecting of me, that's what I'm capable of. And so that became his primary focus. So going into the race, he, he, he got super intense, uh, more intense than he normally did. You know, in, in the ready room, he had his music blaring and a towel over his head, was getting himself all psyched up for this race. Um, came out of the ready room with the towel still draped over his head, just really locked in on this, this I've got to win the gold medal, I've got to set the world record. And um, anyway, got into the race, got off to a decent start. Uh, the best part of his racing was his turns. So it's 50 meters down, 50 meters back, he goes 50 meters, makes his turn, comes off the wall, and uh, opened up a, a pretty significant lead. Um, but then, something started to happen. Um, because he said, I have to win an Olympic gold, I have to win this race, I have to, to uh, be a gold medal winner, what do you think might have started to happen? Yeah? He was swimming, not to lose, or he was swimming, not to lose instead of swimming to win. Yeah, yeah. He started to tighten up. And then the tightening up physically was due to some of that, that mental pressure that he was putting on himself. I have to win, or another way of saying this is I can't lose. And so um, Mark Tewksbury, a Canadian swimmer, was on his left side on the left lane, and he started to close that gap. And Jeff Rouse was aware that he was gaining on him, and what do you think happens? You know, Mark Tewksbury gets more confidence, more positive feeling. Uh, Jeff Rouse started to tighten up even more. And by the time they got to touch the wall, if you watched it on TV, you, look, you couldn't tell who won the race. It looked like it was a, a tie. But what uh, Jeff, Jeff Rouse was actually out-touched by six one-hundredths of a second. Now, blink your eyes, nope, nope, that's six one-hundredths of a second. So, it was, it was, you know, that's what we're talking about, you know, just that, that little difference. And what could have made that difference change? So Jeff Rouse, he went away from that Olympics. Very discouraged, very disappointed. He felt like he had failed. He had let himself down, his country down, his swim team and coaches, and just was really distraught about that for quite a while. Uh, took some time off from swimming to kind of just uh, get a perspective of where, what he was going to do next. Uh, after a little time away, he decided he was going to train for the next Olympic Games, which was going to be held in Atlanta in 1996. So in 1996, he, he goes back. Um, at that point, he wasn't quite as fast as he had been earlier in his career, um, but he went in with a whole different mental approach. And this is, this is the significant piece, okay? So he goes into this race and he said, you know what, last Olympics I got too serious and I got too focused on that outcome. I've got to win, I've got to set the Olympic record, or the world record. So this Olympics, he wanted to do it differently. And he visualized this all the way leading up to the Olympic Games. When he got there, he wasn't going to be so serious. He was going to be more relaxed. He was going to have more fun with the, the whole experience. Um, when he was in the ready room, he was going to listen to some upbeat music, but he was going to keep his, his eyes up. When he came out of the ready room, he found his, par his parents and family up in the crowd and gave them a, a nod or a wave, recognizing that they're there to support him. And it just went into a, a whole different attitude. But one of the main differences was his focus in the pool. He wanted to just focus on the process of swimming well, rather than the outcome of I have to do something. The process is he wanted to focus on, he called it easy speed. When he's at his best as a swimmer, he's in the water, doing his strokes, and he feels the easy speed. There's a rhythm to it, a smoothness to it, a flow to it. And that's what he wanted to focus on. And so the last thing he said before he got into the pool is he said, okay, just, just like practice, just treat this like practice. 
and then he got set and ready to go, and the, and the race went on. And um, obviously, I wouldn't be telling you the story if he got fourth place, right? Okay. <laughs> so he did go out. He didn't break the world record, but he did win the Olympic gold medal going away. It was at least a length that he had won by. Um, but just as importantly, he had a good time with the experience. And, and that's, that's part of this. Why do you play your sports? Because you're competitors. You want to do well. You want to win, right? Winning's fun. But you also want to enjoy the process, too, of going out and competing well against other people, giving it your best, having them give their best, and see what happens. And so he was able to, to do that. So let's, let's get into the performance routines now. So on your handout, on the front page, um, I, I have a picture of a funnel. And that's significant. I want you to pay attention to the funnel. Um, everything is funneling down. Your pregame routines, everything you do is intended to get you ready to play. Now you hear that phrase all the time. You read the sports, sports page in the newspaper, you listen to the commentators on ESPN, you're going to hear that phrase all the time. Oh man, these guys really came ready to play tonight. Well, what's that mean? Now, uh, for a long time, and as a sports psychologist, I was trying to define what that meant. Um, but it really comes down to, I think, three key things. Getting yourself positively energized. That's one thing you want your pregame routine to do, give you positive energy. Secondly, you want to be in a, in a good emotional state. Okay, we'll talk more about that in a minute. And then you want to be focused on the task at hand. When it's game time, you don't want to be focused on a lot of different things. You want to be dialed in, zoned in on what you're doing right here, right now on the tasks that are necessary for you to execute well so that you can perform well. And that's what getting ready to play is all about. What can you do to get yourself energized in a good emotional state and, and your focus uh, where it needs to be? So you can, down under the uh, funnel, under where it says ready to play, I talk about the funnel a little more. So everything you do in your performance routine is designed to narrow that focus. Okay, now obviously if you begin your performance routine the night before, you don't want to be super hyper-focused the night before your, your game, do you? What happens if you do that? Probably don't sleep very well, right? Probably don't rest very well. You're probably getting your activation level up too soon. So you want to maybe think about it a little bit, but not dwell on it, not over, overly focus on it. Okay? So at the beginning, you're going to be, be more broad, but as it gets down to game time, now those last few minutes, you want to do whatever it takes to give you give you that energy, emotion, and focus. Second thing is, the further you go through the funnel, the closer you get to game time. And this is really important, you want to simplify your routine. Less is better when it gets close to game time, okay? Think about it this way, if you, if you are in school and you have a test coming up, and you've studied for the test, and you've got about 10 or 15 minutes right before you go into the test, do you want to start reviewing your notes and the highlights in your book and talking to other people about what's on the test and try to cram more and more and more in those last few minutes? I know most of us have done that. But ideally, if you've prepared yourself well, those last 10 or 15 minutes, you want to do just the opposite. You want to, you want to just relax and talk about other things, get your mind off the test. You're going to be moving from thinking about performing from thinking about the test to just trusting yourself, trusting your training, trusting your preparation. So you want to simplify. The next thing is you want to move from your left brain into your right brain. What do I mean by that? Our left brain is kind of a, a verbal part of our brain. It's where we think, and we think in terms of words. So we tell ourselves what to do. We kind of coach ourselves up. The closer you get to performance, you want to shift your focus over into the right brain. The right brain is more where you see yourself performing and executing. You feel it in your body. So it's imagery, it's visualization. That's what all great athletes do, isn't it? They picture themselves executing like they want to in the upcoming game or performance. Or they review highlights of their, their uh, past performances to kind of build confidence before they go. So you want to move into that right brain. We'll talk a little more about that too. Um, transform yourself into your performance persona. What do I mean by that? Let me give you an example. Bernard King was one of the great basketball players in the 1980s. Played for the New York Knicks. 
I just saw a 30 for 30 special on him on ESPN, and I thought this was a really good example. Bernard King was known for being really intense. When it, when it was game time, he's, he's one of those guys that has that game face on, that intensity, that look in his eyes. Michael Jordan was another one kind of like that. You know, there's just a look uh, about them. And not that everybody has to have that look, but for them, that was their performance persona. They were competitive. They were, they were, uh, um, they were fierce in how they competed. It was, you know, they were fiery, and that was kind of his, his mentality. So um, he talked about uh, a rookie that was on the team with him that, that one of those years, uh, told a story and said, you know, I, we were going through warm-ups and I was all loose and looking up into the stands and I saw a movie star up in the stands and I went up to Bernard and I said, hey Bernard, look over there in the fifth row, there's so-and-so. And, -so. and uh, Bernard King snapped at him, got mad, got in his face and said, rookie, don't ever bother me when I'm getting myself ready to play. And basically what he was saying there is, I'm doing something to get myself ready to play. I don't care who's in the fifth row in the stands. You know, for me, I'm getting ready. That's his performance persona. And so for some people, it's going to be different. Let's, let's take two other examples. Uh, how many of you have watched Usain Bolt race? Okay. What, what's he look like before he races? As you think of the, you know, as they're introducing the, the runners from the different countries and they're putting the camera on him. What have you noticed about Usain Bolt? Is he, is he super serious and real intense in his face? I think he's pretty relaxed. What's that? He's pretty relaxed. He's pretty relaxed. He's pretty loose. He, he's kind of a, he has more of a fun personality. For him, you know, he wants to feel, he's having fun. You know, he's doing his little poses and he's having fun and he's interacting with the crowd. And, you know, that, that works for him. Now, another athlete in exactly the same races, Michael Johnson from the United States, who was the previous world record holder in the 200 meters and still holds the 400 meter record, he's the opposite. I mean, he's got that intensity, like I described with Bernard King. His eyes are locked in and focused. He's, he looks mean and mad and angry, and that works for him. So those are the, the performance personas, and you kind of got to find what works best for you. And it's going to depend on your personality, your sport, um, obviously, if you're a golfer, you're not going to want that same intensity when you're getting ready to putt on the 18th hole. You know that's that's not going to work. So it's kind of going to depend on your sport. But uh, that's part of what a performance routine is designed to do. And then again, as we talked about, moving from a thinking mode to a trusting mode. So let's go down to the bottom of your first page handout, uh, Ben. I have something that's very important to maximize your personal performance. Okay. You have to choose to be intentional about everything that you do. If you really want to be your best, you want to be intentional about it. Okay? You don't want to just show up for the game hoping that you play well. You want to do everything you can to prepare yourself so you leave nothing to chance. Now, there, on your uh, second page is a picture of LeBron James. And I have had his picture on there for a couple of reasons. We'll go back to it in a few minutes. But LeBron James. Obviously, is a tremendous talent. Just you know, a physical specimen. He's perfect for his sport. Um, he works hard. He trains hard. All of that. But one thing a lot of people don't know about uh, LeBron James is just how detailed he is about his preparation for his games. Um, so in the NBA, they have 82 games in a season. He'll spend so the 41 home games. He has exactly the same routine every game. He eats his pre-game meal from 4 to 5 o'clock. 5 o'clock, he leaves his home, he goes to the arena. When he gets to the arena, he changes into his workout clothes, does his stretching, does some light lifts, um, uh, gets a little bit of treatment, and then he goes out to the court. When he gets out to the court, he has a very specific shooting pre-game routine that he goes on, where he shoots from so many shots from different spots on the court. After he's done all of that, then he goes back in, changes into his game uniform, and that's when the team routines start. So at that point, he's kind of done his personal preparation. Now the team kind of does their thing with him. Um, at the playoffs last year, they showed his routine. Now again, you've got to consider these players have played, at the time they're in the finals, the NBA finals, they've played up to 90 to 100 games already that season. So his, his main focus is just getting his body ready for the next game. So he would get up, he would have breakfast, he would have a massage, he would watch a little bit of game film, 
He would eat his lunch. He would um, uh, take a nap, become rest and recovery. Then he would have his second massage. Very detailed. It was the same thing every day during the playoff series. Okay? So back to that course, the bottom. Being intentional about everything you do. You want to get to your, your routine so fine-tuned that you're doing basically the same thing every time that's working for you. And while you're trying to figure it out, you know, you may change it up a little bit. But overall, you want to eventually get to the point where you're doing very similar things. Okay, let's let's shift gears for just a minute. So we're going to go to page two now. I'm going to talk briefly about some mental barriers. Okay, these are things that tend to get in the way of performance for athletes. Okay, so let's talk about a few of these, and then then we're going to get into the mental uh, mental tools that uh, you can incorporate into your performance routine. So the first one is performance anxiety. How many of you've been nervous before a performance? Okay, good. Hopefully everyone raised their hand. Okay. It's normal. It's normal. People feel nervous. It's important to you. You've trained hard. You've gotten yourself ready. That nervousness is normal. It's okay. Um, but if it's too high, people get tense. They get tunnel vision. Uh, they don't think clearly. They don't. So, so things change. So if the anxiety gets high, so one of the things you got to learn is to kind of manage that anxiety. We'll get into that in a minute. Okay. Self-confidence issues. So maybe sometimes your confidence is high, sometimes it's not quite as high. What do you do to kind of change that? Because if you're not as confident as you'd like to be, that's going to be a barrier for performance. Pressure. Okay? Sports. Is there pressure in sports? Okay? When you go to play your rival school across town, it matters, doesn't it? It matters to the school, it matters to you, it matters to your family. You know, it's, it's important, it's, it's fun. But there's pressure. That's part of it. I was watching a, a, a special on the U.S. women's soccer team from 1999 and won the, the World Cup. And they talked uh, to, uh, so the game went the full 90 minutes, and then the extra period, and it was still tied, so they go to, to penalty kicks, right? So each team, China and the United States, had five people that would take penalty kicks to, uh, to determine who won the game. And they interviewed each of the, the players that took the penalty kicks for the United States, and I still remember one of the, the women said the only thing she was thinking about as it was leading up to her time to go kick the goal or uh, make the attempt at kicking the goal was her legs were shaking so bad she was, a, she was afraid that the people in the stands were going to notice how nervous she was. Did she feel pressure? Of course. You know, she's in the Rose Bowl in front of 100,000 fans plus all of the TV viewing audience. And this is important. She was nervous. She felt pressure. But then she knew how to deal with it too. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes when we get to the strategy. Fear of failure. You know, worried about failing. What, what happens if I fail? What happens if I don't do well? That can be a real uh, barrier for athletes. The expectations of others. You don't want to let down your coaches, your teammates, your, your uh, uh, family, and others. Okay? I think a big thing to bounce back is how do you bounce back from a poor performance? Maybe the previous day's practice or your warm up didn't go well. That can be a barrier. Um, so those are those are all all some barriers that you have to overcome. Other barriers that you've experienced? What else has gotten in the way of your performance? I'm kind of curious. Anything else that's not that I haven't talked about that? I did most of the main ones. A couple others I would add, overthinking. When you're just overthinking about it, but that's gonna to lead to the, the performance anxiety. Negative self-talk which again is going to drive a lot of these emotions we've talked about. And then back to the Jeff Rouse example of the swimmer, when he was so focused on the outcome at performance time, that can be a barrier. So let's let's get into some mental, mental training tools. I'm going to actually have you walk through a few of these with me as we go through them. So first thing, acceptance. Okay, Athletes need to learn to accept that there's going to be times you're nervous, you feel pressure, you feel fear, your confidence is inside. You've got to be able to know that that's going to be the case. That's part of the gig. And be able to accept that and be okay with it. I like to call that get, learn to get comfortable being uncomfortable. You know, so back to that, that soccer player that I was telling you about. Yes, her legs were shaking. She was nervous. She was worried about what everyone was thinking. But now it was her turn to step up to, to kick the goal kick. And now she's got her performance routine. 
They practiced those kicks all of the time leading up to the Olympics. She had done it a hundred times in practice. So now she just went back, took her deep breath, made her decision what she was going to do, and executed the shot. And was successful, by the way. Um, those routines. She, she was uncomfortable, but she learned to be comfortable and then learned to perform by going back to her routine. Uh, focus plan. Having a focus plan. Um, this goes back to overthinking things. Keeping it, you want to keep it simple. So I like to, to encourage athletes to, to think of, if I can identify one or two keys for me to perform well in tomorrow night's game, what would those be? Okay? Because there's so much you can think about. You know, coaches give you game plans and you have things you're working on and you can think about so many things, but you want to really kind of simplify it down and trust that everything else is going to take care of itself. Um, let me give you a couple of examples of what a focus plan might look like. So as a, as a basketball player, basketball player I worked with had a tendency to overthink things. So one of the things we worked with him on was, okay, think of yourself when you're at your best as a player. What would people notice and recognize? Or what do you feel best about? And he says, you know, when I'm at my best, I'm playing tenacious defense. I said, okay, what's that look like? Get a picture of that in your mind. So I had him close his eyes and picture for just a, a few seconds what it looks like when he's in that defensive stance and playing tenacious defense. And he's bothering the other player just uh, you know, uh, in his face. The second thing he said is when I'm dominating the board, when I'm going hard to, the, to, to rebound. So again, we'd have him picture himself going up and, and grabbing the rebounds and being strong with the ball. Uh, that was an important piece. Then the other thing he said is, you know, when I'm not thinking about my shot, when I catch it in the flow of the offense and I just take my shot in rhythm and it's nice and smooth. So smooth shot. So we have a picture of that. That was his focus plan. Those three things. Trusting that everything else that he's prepared to do will happen. But those are three things that he could control that he wanted to focus on to play well. we give you an example of a golfer. So a golfer's focus plan. Uh, this, this female golfer said she played best when she was calm, when she was decisive, so when she decided what shot, what club she was going to use, she wanted to be decisive about it, and then be aggressive in executing that shot. So again, is that something she can picture? Picture herself being calm as she walks the golf course, picture herself making a good decision, being decisive about it, and then stepping up and really executing the shot, being aggressive rather than being attentive. Okay, so there's a focus plan. That's, that's an example. So, um, so again, it kind of depends on your sport. But having one or two or three things at most that you're going to focus on when you're going to do a performance. Okay. Okay. Mindful breathing. Let's let's actually have you do this with me for a couple minutes. So go ahead and sit up in your chairs, your feet flat on the floor, preferably uncross your arms and legs, and you just kind of rest your hands on your lap. Yeah. Put your sheets on the floor if you want. We're going to do this for about three minutes, okay? So I want you to actually experience this rather than just talk about it. Okay, so go ahead and uh, look down toward the floor, bow your head a little bit, close your eyes if you're comfortable doing so. And here's what I want you to do. For the next few minutes, I just want you to bring your full attention to your breathing. Just notice what it feels like to inhale and to exhale. Breathe in, to breathe out. You might notice the fill of the air as you breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. Maybe you notice the rise and the fall of your chest, stomach, and shoulders with each breath. Notice the rhythm of your breathing. It doesn't really matter which aspect you choose. Just pick something and focus on that. Give you a few minutes without me talking now to do that. If you get distracted by a thought or a sound or a bodily sensation, just notice that your mind is wandering and bring your focus back to your breathing.
Hold that. Relax. Okay. Body a little bit more relaxed. Maybe your mind a little calm. Okay. That's kind of what we're shooting for. You know, to, uh, let's go back to the performance anxiety. You're feeling a lot of pressure. You're kind of fearful going into a performance. Where is that created? It's created by what you're telling yourself about the game. You're overthinking it. You're thinking about it in negative terms, in negative possibilities. So one good way to, to counter that, you can counter it with other thoughts, but sometimes when you're already all amped up and your mind's racing and you try to put more thought into it, even if it's positive thought, it's just more thinking and more everything. Sometimes you need to calm, you need to bring things down, you need to, to, to quiet the mind, relax the body. So sometimes one of the better ways to quiet the mind is to relax the body first. The mind will kind of follow. So that's one of the reasons we do the, the mindful breathing. It, gets, it has a tendency to quiet the mind, relax your body. The body scan, the, the last part we did, I kind of went through it a little quickly tonight, but I just wanted you to at least experience it briefly. That's another uh, way of, of getting yourself to relax. So let's say you're standing there for or introductions or the national anthem, you're feeling kind of tight, tight and tense. You know, you can do that. You don't have to close your eyes, lay down, sit down, and just stand there and just kind of focus on relaxing your face, relaxing your neck and shoulders, relaxing your arms. Just kind of let that, that uh, relaxation just spread throughout your body. Again, as you're doing that, as you're relaxing the body, you're going to be calming your mind. A calm mind. Is a trusting mind. A trusting mind leads to better performance. Okay, there's other exercises you can do like that, but I want to give you real quick and practical ones. And most of the time, you're not going to go way down and uh, decide. You're, you're trying to keep your energy level up too, right? So can you have a high energy level and a relaxed body? Absolutely. And that's really uh, an important combination for most athletes is to have a, a highly energized body, but still the muscles are relaxed and loose. Okay. All right, let's move into the next couple. Now we're going to look at kind of mental ways of getting yourself ready. Positive programming. Um, nowadays we have smartphones that are wonderful. Uh, they do so many things. One thing I would encourage you to do is go to the notes part of your phone and come up with a list of 15 to 20 statements that describe you when you're at your best. I'm confident, I'm strong, I'm fast, um, I belong with the best, I bring out the best in my teammates, um, I love playing soccer. Um, those types of statements, you notice most of them are I am statements, as if you already are that person. So think back to when you're at your best and describe yourself in those types of terms. Put it in your phone, write it in your phone, then you can read them to yourself out loud. Your phone has a audio function. Put some of your favorite music in the background and read those statements to yourself. So now as you prepare for performance, you're hearing yourself be that confident athlete. You're hearing it in your own words. You're saying it with your own voice. You're reading it with your own eyes. Okay? That's what positive programming is all about. And uh, we'll get into how you might use that in your routine in a few minutes. Okay, positive self-talk. The, the, the difference here that I want to make, the positive programming is kind of a proactive way of doing it. You're, you're taking charge and you're telling yourself what to think. The positive self-talk, what I mean by that is if you catch yourself being more nervous, more anxious, uh, fearful, scared, feeling pressure, not as confident, that's when you kind of got to take charge and say, okay, I need to tell myself some positive things right now. And so that, that's just noticing the negative stuff that causes those other uh, emotions you don't want to have and replacing it with more positive words. Okay? Imagery. How many of you visualize? I'd like to see your hands. How many of you visualize your performances right now currently? Okay. So it's about half a year or more to raise your hands. And here's what I want uh, to, to emphasize here. Again, we're moving from the left brain to the right brain. Left brain, we think about performing. Right brain, we see it, we feel it, we experience it mentally. You know, our minds really don't know the difference between what's real and what's vividly imagined. So when we vividly imagine ourselves doing well, when you do well, what's that do to your confidence? It elevates it, right? So when you see and feel yourself having successes, even though it's just in your mind, it's still going to boost that confidence. 
and it's going to give you a chance to mentally rehearse or practice some of the, the skills that you've been working on, which actually works the motor centers of your brain, which is, I think, is interesting. So not only are you building confidence, but you're actually doing some rehearsal. Your, your brain and your body, the muscle memory, uh, those firings in your brain, you're actually performing the skill and being successful. Okay? And then the last one, look at LeBron James's pose on your paper there. That's an example of a power pose. This, this is really interesting to me. There's a, um, a, a researcher by the name of Amy Cuddy. If you're interested, parents especially, if you're interested, there's a TED Talk by Amy Cuddy uh, on, the, on, the, on the importance of power posing. And basically what she's saying there, what she found in her research is that before a test, before a job interview, before an athletic performance, when people will actually stand up, stand up tall, get into a, a big position like we see with LeBron James there, you know, hands on the hips, it actually elevates our testosterone level and it decreases our cortisol levels, which is the, the stress hormone. And so it actually helps you physically feel more confident. Okay? So that's going to kind of help match that. So the power posing. So think of the national anthem, those of you that watch uh, the NBA, for instance. You know, as, as uh, because of what I do for my profession, I pay attention to these things. But if you watch LeBron James when they're going through the national anthem, he's standing in a power pose, he's got his eyes closed, and I know from hearing interviews that one of the things he's doing there is he's kind of doing his last few images, a visualization of what he's going to do that night in the game. Okay? So that's a nice combination of using a lot of the different things we're talking about here uh, moments before you actually uh, step on the floor to play the game. All right, last, last part I'm going to go through here, um, and then I'm going to leave the back page to you to kind of work on on your own. But uh, let me give you an example. Okay, so back to the funnel. So the night before, I'm just using these four time periods, the night before, the morning of the performance, sometime during the day, uh, those last few hours, and then what do you do those last few minutes? So those are the time frames we're going to use. So you can modify that according to how you want to do it. So the night before, the coach is emphasizing the importance of a good pregame meal, right? Of eating well the night before. Okay, that's the time to carbo load. And I'm not a nutritionist, so I'm not going to pretend to be one, but um, you're, uh, it's important. What you eat, how you fuel yourself, how you hydrate, is going to be really important that night before your performance. And obviously the days leading up to that too. But kind of take that pre-game meal as kind of your opportunity to say, I'm fueling my body in a way that I'm going to be ready to go tomorrow. That's going to enhance confidence too. The focus plan, we already talked about it. Pick your one, two, three things you want to focus on doing particularly well in tomorrow night's game. Write those down. Okay? And then mentally rehearse them. So the, the, the fifth bullet, I think it is, is imagery. Now visualize. Lay down, close your eyes, kind of go to the movies of your mind, picture yourself executing the focus plan that you just wrote down. Doing those two, three, four things that you're going to do, doing them really well. Okay? The positive programming. Again, listen to yourself, saying those positive words. I'm ready, I'm confident, I'm strong, I, uh, I love to play. Whatever your list is, you, know, you can use the uh, time to kind of go through your, your positive programming. Um, one of the last things I like to emphasize on the, 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 the night before games is most athletes are a little bit, uh, especially if you've done positive programming and focus planning and some imagery, sometimes you can get your activation level up. Now you kind of need to calm yourself down, let go of the performance, it's not going to be until tomorrow, so you don't want to overthink about it. So now it's, that's a nice time to do some mindful breathing, to do that body scan, to get yourself into a relaxed place. Maybe you listen to some soft music, something that relaxes you and takes your mind away from the performance. So if you, you'll notice one thing I'm saying here is you want to be intentional about programming the right things in, but then you got to let go of it. Now it's time to distance yourself from it a little bit and trust that uh, you'll get back to it tomorrow, okay? And then obviously you want to get a good sleep. Have a, have, a, have a very regimented sleep schedule. The night before a game, how many hours do you need? You know yourself, how many hours of sleep do you need? Make sure you go to bed at the right time and get up at the right time. 
sometimes with weekend games, some athletes will make the mistake that they don't play till late in the day of, of staying up really late and then sleeping in. Uh, you, you want to get on a very consistent sleep schedule. That's the number of hours and the right hours for you. And, and treat that, uh, really protect that. Okay, game day. Now you wake up, it's the next day. Um, maybe you have school, maybe it's during a week, weekday game, you have school, so you've got to, you don't have a lot of time. Or maybe it's the weekend, but it's, you don't want to lay around thinking about it all day. So, again, go through a brief, you know, 10, 15 minutes where you, uh, after you eat and hydrate well, review your focus plan one more time, maybe do your positive programming, do a little visualization at that point, and then you'll notice I said stay active, mentally, physically, socially. Again, don't dwell on it all day. Get out, do things, hang out with your friends, try to keep your mind off of it. But always remember recovery is important. So you don't want to be on your legs too much, on your feet all day if you've got a big game that night. You know? So kind of, kind of be mindful of that. But try to keep your mind occupied until you get through those last few hours. Uh, and maybe take naps sometime during the day. That was always a big part of my routine when I was playing high school and college, is you know, I'd take a nap uh, after school before I started to get ready for the games. And again, I think you want to keep it short so that you don't get yourself too, you know how you feel sometimes after a long nap where you feel drowsy still, so a short nap can be helpful. Okay, now we get to those last few hours. Okay, remember the funnel. The closer you get to the game, the less you want to be doing, right? So now you're not going to spend a ton of time mentally training yourself. That was the night before, that was the morning of. Now you're going to go ahead and do your pre-game meal, make sure you're not rushing yourself, get to where you need to be on time so that that's not a distraction for you. Listen to your music. You know, your music, I think, is a good way to activate memory. You're trying to get a positive energy, positive emotion, and focus. So listen to music that energizes you in positive ways. It helps you feel good emotionally. Um, you know, if you like to do some little bit of physical uh, preparation, you're stretching. Um, again, I don't necessarily say you lift before the, the game. Some some of the pro athletes do, but just again, find your routine to, to stretch to get your body starting to get your body activated. Then, okay. Uh, and then again, go ahead and interact with your coaches and teammates. And now we're down to those last few minutes. Okay, maybe warm ups are over. Now it's, it's time to, you've just got a few seconds left before the start of your performance. Um, obviously you want to have a good warm up, get yourself physically ready to go. That's a good time to do the power pose. Okay, that's a good time to, to, to stand strong, be strong, stand confident, um, think confident, uh, maybe take a couple of deep breaths if you feel activated to kind of calm you down just a little bit. If you feel like you're not warmed up enough, maybe jump around a little bit to get the heart rate up and, Get your, your energy level up. And then I have down here snapshot images. And what I mean by that is just quick images of yourself doing something well. Just one, two, three quick images of something positive. And then the last one, and this one's really important, at some point you've got to just let go and say, okay, I've done everything I can do to prepare. Now it's time to just trust it and let it happen. And I actually encourage athletes to even say those words to themselves. Okay, I'm ready. Just trust and let it happen. Here we go. And I think that's, uh, that's an important, important part of this. So here's what I want you to do. Um, I want to open it up for a few, a few minutes of questions uh, and discuss it a little bit. But on the back side, I've given you a little bit of space. I want you to, to, to take what we've talked about tonight, take what you already know about yourself, what you already do. Maybe talk to your parents and your coaches. Um, but I want you to kind of go through this and start to fill this out. And, and again, back to that quote on the, on the front of the page, to maximize performance, you want to be intentional about everything you do. And that's what I want you to do, is write this down. How do I like to feel physically? How do I like to feel emotionally? What, what would be a good example of a focus plan? And then go ahead and write out your performance routine so that you can actually start practicing it and seeing how it works for you. Questions? Questions or comments? Yes? Yeah? Huh? Um, you know, a lot of times, at, and as a coach, coach's perspective, uh, you take, and I know in volleyball and basketball, you take that time out as a coach. How do you, how do you say it? How do you refocus the kids when they're just making mental mistakes? You know that the skill is there and they're making mental mistakes. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things that, as a coach you could say to get them focused back? 
Have you found anything that's worked well yet? Well, <laughs> just some curious. of the things that you've said, I've tried, yeah. you know, like, yeah. let's just get back to the basics, keep it simple. You know, yeah. those are the things that yeah. I've tried, you yeah. know. Um, I just don't know. I mean, this is all really good, and I'm going to, you know, yeah. this is really good. But. It, it's a great question, and I think it's going to be different for different athletes, and it's going to be different for different teams. Right. You know, there, there's some athletes, and I'm, I'm not one that... Uh, is big on on uh, yelling at athletes, but you know what? So, sometimes with some athletes or some teams, they're just kind of going through the motions. They're not focused. Their their activation levels low. They're flat. Sometimes you gotta be a little fiery with them to kind of wake them up. You know, um, that's that's gonna be. You kind of have to read that and see what do you think it is that's causing them to to make all those mental mistakes. Are they flat? Are they not thinking well of that. But the other side, and this is what I see more often, is athletes are trying too hard. They're overactivated, and they know they're not playing well, and they're, so they're, they're kind of getting uh, frantic. And in those situations, you probably need to do just the opposite. You need to talk to them in a calm way, give them some very simple instructions, um, um, express your confidence in them, you know. So again, I wish there was a, an easy answer for everything. I know you're not asking for that, but I think you kind of have to read the, the team or the athlete and kind of see what it is that's leading them to have the mental lapse that they're having. Is it overactivation or are they underactivated? Are they emotionally not into it? You know, so anyway. Yes? I just have a comment. Yes? I think a lot of that has to do with the way the athlete is your entire approach is to coaching the team in the first place. So if you're your practices are high strung or high activity all the time and you're letting the kids go there and do that, that's more, to rein them in, it's going to be a little bit harder, I would, I would think. Mm -hmm. If you've got that, hey, let's go calm down and everybody take a moment to take a deep breath together to center themselves, yep. I think if if they all of a sudden need to be centered again, you pull them off the court and say, everyone close your eyes and take a deep breath, that's going to have a better response for the team. So I get that whatever you do in practice definitely carries over to games, totally. not just the way they're performing, but the way it's being coached also. Great comment. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think your practices should be simulations of, of games. Yeah. So you, know, you practice some of those things and how you coach people in practice as well. I still remember uh, watching a video of Mike Krzyzewski. Uh, obviously, everyone knows that he's been very, very successful with everything he's done in coaching wise. Um, he was talking about uh, in the NCAA tournament uh, several years ago, one of the years they won their national championship, um, they were just getting killed by Maryland in, uh, I think it was the Final Four game or Elite Eight, game, one of the two. I think they were down 20 points, you know, and just playing horrible. And, you know, he, he came into the huddle and he kind of talked to him about, okay, everybody take a deep breath. So we need, to, we need to calm down for a second. And then he talked about it and he said, you know, look at me. And then he kind of got into his power pose. He said, look at me. He said, I believe in you. We're going to win this game tonight. You know, I believe in you. So if you're not confident in yourself right now, then look at me and get the confidence from me. And, uh, and then he said, we're not going to run any plays for now. I just want you to treat this like it's a, a, a pickup game in the gym. You go out there, you guys trust each other, you know how to play the game, so let's, no, let's go. And he talked about, and they, they actually, I wouldn't have told the story again if it didn't turn out well. But they go out, they come back, you know, this is great, one of the great uh, uh, comebacks in college basketball history. But I think that that was a good example of being able to read your team and kind of know what they need and, and emphasize it at that time of day. Other, other thoughts, comments, questions? I know it's uh, been an hour, so I know you're all busy and have other things to do, so won't keep you too long if you don't have any other questions. But I'm happy to stay around for a few minutes afterwards if, uh, if someone just wants to uh, ask an individual question, not do it in front of the whole group, too.